Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the to the organizers for putting up such a great event. It would be, of course, much nicer to see you all uh, personally, but it's really nice to be able to share and talk about research in this format as well. Uh, I will be talking today about missing migrants and um, I will use my 10 minutes uh, to uh, bring over two points uh, from uh, my research and thoughts that I have on missing migrants. So I will uh, start off talking about the risks uh, of using uh, a term uh, that is not defined in a very wide way. And secondly, uh, I will uh, touch upon the accountability gap uh, that uh, missing migrants are uh, faced with. And so as we all know, migrants, um, migrants going missing is not a new phenomenon. Uh, they always, always people migrating uh, went missing. However, during the last decade, uh, the, the, the challenge has increased and that has also met with uh, many new initiatives made by, by the main stakeholders in the field. So the ICRC has put up uh, many initiatives aimed specifically at missing migrants with the first conference in 2013. The IOM has run a missing migrant program since 2014. The ICMP, which is an organization dedicated especially to missing persons, runs a missing migrant program since 2018. And in the same year, the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration included an objective specifically for uh, missing migrants. So uh, the term, as we can see, is, is really widely used. Um, and uh, while, when we look at how those organizations and documents and reports uh, and other NGOs use the term missing migrants, we will see that it actually applies to often to different groups of persons. And that is the first risk uh, I will talk about too uh, that I wanted uh, to, uh, to raise. So um, using this term can lead to the misconception that the same subject is debated. While the difference between the programs uh, and documents uh, for uh, is, is, is really um, enormous. Uh, for example, um, the IOM Missing Migrant Program is a program that is aimed at tracking fatalities. So it's only at those that have died or disappeared while crossing an international border, which is an additional uh, limitation, as we uh, as we know. And secondly, there is uh, there are some very important exceptions. So no deaths or disappearances that happen in refugee housing or centers are included in the country. Out, and nor are deaths or disappearances after deportations. And so the numbers included in the IOM programs will be uh, very different from numbers uh, given by other actors who include a bigger number of, of missing migrants. At the same time, it also has very practical uh, implications. Because if we consider as missing migrants those that, have, those that have died on the ways, then the way that missing migrants will be addressed is by exhumations, identifications, DNA programs, or communicating to families about fatalities. And those um, ways uh, to address missing migrants will not be relevant for missing migrants that are in immigration uh, detention centers and are not able to communicate with their families or are missing for other reasons. Uh, the second uh, risks that um, I would argue that using this term so wide brings is that it encompasses person that are persons that are actually um, protected, uh, additionally protected by international law. And by using the wider term of to, with regards to all of them, it can blur the obligations that uh, state parties have uh, in uh, two particular uh, persons. And, and that brings me to, to the second point that I wanted to raise today. So to the accountability gap with regard to searching for missing migrants and to uh, communicating with their families. Migrants uh, go missing for various different ways. Most of the time we've heard about migrants that uh, went missing due to drownings on sea. Uh, some go missing uh, due to armed conflict. Uh, some are forcibly disappeared. Uh, some are unable to establish contact with families. And here the inability can also be caused by very different, uh, various different reasons. So they can be in a detention center where communication is not made possible, or they can be just technical impossibilities to get in touch with their families due to, again, different reasons. 
uh, some migrants, and this is of course a very limited group, just chooses not to get in touch with their families and, uh, and because of that are still considered missing. So the circumstances uh, why uh, the particular migrants become missing um, trigger different legal frameworks and as such uh, different um, um, uh, laws have been raised by academics, researchers and also by the stakeholders that I've mentioned before. But very often IHL, human rights law, of course law of the sea, anti-smuggling regulations, uh, currently often positive obligations in various different contexts. Most of the time, however, those consider um, um, a migrant's death and re uh, regulating uh, migration. And they, they do not, uh, most of those uh, frameworks do not have any specific regulations concerning uh, the obligation to search uh, for a missing person and to inform the families about the search. Such obligation arise only in two frameworks, in IHL and human rights law. And as such, uh, the organizations that have pro um, a project aimed at missing migrants raise the obligations precisely with regard to missing persons and forcibly disappeared persons. When we look at who is considered a missing person or a forcibly disappeared person, we will see that only a very limited number of missing migrants will be considered one of the two. So raising those frameworks with which in fact contain obligations that are very relevant for missing migrants will not be applicable. So just to show you that shortly missing persons in IHL is not a defined term. Uh, however, um, treaty law applies to those that went missing due to armed conflict and additional protocol two, which has the most specific provisions. Um, those obligations arise with regard to persons that were reported by an adverse party. And as we can imagine, it's practically very unlikely that an adverse party will report a migrant that went missing, even if it's connected to an armed conflict. Um, the framework on enforces appearances, which has even more specific obligations concerning the search and informing the families, in particular families need to be informed not only about the fate of the person, but also about the progress of the investigation. Uh, or applies to those that were disappeared uh, in the context of a deprivation of liberty, which has to be connected to a state and was followed by refusal to acknowledge or conceal the fate of the, of the missing person. Of the, of the disappeared person. And uh, some missing migrants will in fact be uh, considered for and for disappeared persons. And uh, the, the framework that was is established and is enforced applies also to after you know, the, the person was uh, released. So uh, as long as all the circumstances of the disappearance were not uh, revealed, um, those uh, provisions can be uh, raised. And they will apply, for example, to those missing migrants or those migrants that at some point were victims of secret detention, for example, secret immigration detention. Um, and um, as you can see, my argument is that uh, under state, uh, that state obligation under international law arise depending on the very circumstances uh, of the missing and not on being a missing migrant per se. And treating them as one group can blur those obligations. And let me use my last minute or last one and a half minute uh, to show that on the basis of uh, one example. Um, so in the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, there's one objective aimed specifically at missing persons. It's uh, called Saving Lives and Establish Coordinating International Effort on Missing Persons, uh, Missing Migrants. And it starts, the paragraph starts with two sentences. In the first sentence, the states commit to saving life and preventing migrant death, and here I quote, in accordance with international law. And then the second sentence starts, we further commit uh, to identify missing and dead and to facilitate communication with fam uh, families. So this implies that there is an uh, obligation under international law to uh, save lives and prevent migrant death and uh, just a further commitment, not in accordance with international law, to identify and to facilitate communication with families which uh, in, in, I would argue is not, uh, is not the fact because if a migrant is a forcibly disappeared person, then there is a clear international obligation both with regard to the identification and to the facilitating information to the families. And it's not a further commitment that states can or um, cannot do. And the same is true for persons that went missing due to an armed conflict. Here again, the states are responsible to communicate to the families. 
And so, uh, and uh, from uh, from the other hand, the obligation to um, uh, save lives has also been tackled by various researchers. And uh, there is a valid argument that there is a policy fully compliant with international law can tolerate large scale migrant death uh, at sea. And as such, those two sentences are, in my uh, opinion, blurring uh, can blur the obligations of state that depend on the circumstances of the missing more than on missing migrants. Uh, per se. Thank you.